invite you to open your Bible to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 2. We're looking at John's letters, calling them love letters, these great letters that John wrote to encourage the church and to remind the church of how they're loved by him, by Christ, and how they're to love one another and the world that Christ has put them in. John didn't see himself merely as a pastor of a church. He really saw himself, I believe, as a parent of spiritual children. He looked at those in the congregation as if they were his own children or perhaps even grandchildren. And the church had been a little battered and a little beat up. There had been some false teachers in the church. They had confused uh, those in the church. They were trying to lead some astray. And John went in as a loving parent, (laughs) and he cleaned house. He didn't want his children, to be damaged and harmed. So John cleaned things up. He cleared these false teachers out of the church. But the church was left discouraged and down, and so John wrote to encourage them. And this passage we'll look at this morning is a little difficult, and it's somewhat hard to understand, but I think you'll hear John's heart coming through, this wonderful, loving, compassionate heart. Now, 1 John 2, verse 18, John writes, Dear children, This is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Let's w- walk through this passage. John begins by talking about life in, in the last hour. And we'll address that question in a moment. But you notice this passage also brings up some other really interesting questions, like, Who or what is John talking about when he talks about the Antichrist or Antichrists, plural? And then what does he mean by these false Christs? Do we have false Christs today? Do we have those who would seek to lead us astray today in our world like John did way back then? And if so, how do we protect ourselves from these fake saviors? Well, let's begin where John begins. Let's look at life in the last hour. In verse 18, John writes, Dear children, this is the last hour. You notice I put a couple of parallel lines on the outline. Uh, The space between these lines represents the period of time between the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and then Christ's return. So his first coming and, and then his final coming, his return to bring us to glory. We live life in that span <laughs> in, in the middle. Now, Jesus taught us a lot about what will happen in this span of time. In Matthew 28, or excuse me, 24, and Luke chapter 21, Jesus gives a, a long list of things that we're to expect in this period in which we're living. And it's a horrible list. Jesus says there'll be wars, There'll be rumors of wars. There'll be famines, earthquakes. Jesus talked about false Christs. 
And then there will be a time when brothers will murder brothers and parents will kill their own children. And, and these things have always happened. John says this is the last hour. That was 2,000 years ago. So it's a long hour. It's always been true. But Jesus said it'll get more and more intense as we get closer to the end. Now, I, I thought of this, and I thought, you know, during this time period, on one hand, there's times when the church goes through a period of comfort and ease when life isn't that difficult. And then the other extreme, up on top, are times of, of persecution, suffering, uh, being mistreated for the gospel of Christ. And my observation is, is that through history, the church has kind of gone up and down in this. And, and this is by no means a scientific line, that wavy line through here. And it's just to illustrate there are times when God allows us to go through periods of relative ease, comfort, and then there's times where there's intense persecution. And it seems to go back and forth generally, and it's been doing that for the last 2,000 years. Now, if you look at this, where do you think, if you had to chart it out, where do you think we would be as Christians in America, maybe for the last couple hundred years, maybe, last few decades? Where have we been on this? Uh, I, I think that last dip there that's right on the comfort ease line, that's where I would put us. And we've had it pretty easy. We live in a country where we have freedom to worship, uh, where we're not put in jail for the gospel. We have been blessed in this time period with relative comfort and ease. And Jesus says that will come to an end. And persecution will come. Suffering will come. And it will get intense. It's hard to believe that this isn't the last hour. That we live in a time when persecution will come. Jesus said to expect it. And that these things must happen for the end to come. Jesus wrote these things. John writes these words so that we will not be surprised by the suffering, but actually be encouraged. Know that God's at work. He is bringing about his purpose, and his return is, is on the way. John says this is the last hour. What do you think? <laughs> you see an increase in wars, rumors of wars, about earthquakes and famines, hostility, False Christs, false saviors. Just getting more and more and more intense. Just as Jesus said it would. Jesus is on his way. And our response, Christ says, is to keep watch. To stay alert. To be ready at all times for his return. To be about his business when he comes back. Not to be lazy. Not to be asleep. But when he returns, we should be hard at work advancing the kingdom of God to the glory of Christ. Now, what I want to share with you <clears throat> is this whole notion of counterfeit Christ or, or anti-Christ. It's somewhat disturbing when we read what John wrote. What does he mean when he talks about the anti-Christ or anti-Christ? This phrase, this anti-Christ, is actually it's unique to John. John's the only writer in Scripture that, in the New Testament that talks about Antichrist. Uh, Paul does talk about the man of lawlessness that will arrive before the return of Christ. So John is not talking about a capital A big Antichrist that's going to come and lead masses of people astray. John's talking about these little A Antichrists. And it's not just a person, maybe, but an idea, a philosophy, a belief, some kind of pull or tug in our culture. Uh, the word anti means against or opposite. So it's obvious it's someone who's opposite, anti, against Christ. And if you're not for Christ, you're against Christ. There's, there's, no, there's no middle ground. You're either for Christ or against Christ. You're either for Christ or anti-Christ. The word anti, it means against or opposite. But it can also mean instead of or in the place of. So this is a philosophy, it's a teaching, it can be a person who claims that 
There needs to be something in addition to Christ or something other than Christ to save us. It's a usurper, one who operates under false pretenses, seeking to lead us astray. Now, how do we spot these antichrists? Uh, John says a couple things. One is belief, and the other is by their behavior. Uh, the word belief, he uses the word deny. One who denies Christ, who denies Christ, who denies Christ. Who is a liar, he said. It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. So I want to pause here and do a little theology with you. And this is a great opportunity for us to look at Christ. Who is Christ? What do we believe about Christ? The earliest church creed, that is a statement, formal doctrinal statement, the earliest creed that we have is what's called the Apostles' Creed. It comes from um, uh, back to about 140 A.D. This is an old, old, ancient creed. And it says this, this portion of it. It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. This creed is actually very short, and it makes a brief statement about God the Father, a brief statement then to go on to make a statement about the Holy Spirit. Uh, but notice all this language to describe what we believe about Jesus Christ. I found this great image a long time ago. Uh, this is an early church drawing. Uh, it's called the Shield of the Holy Trinity. It uh, goes back to about 1200 or so. And it's in, this is in Latin, so I'm going to give you a break here. I'll give you the, uh, the English version. But this is the best visible thing I've ever seen to help understand the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and how they relate to one another. So you notice at the top, there's that, that on the left one, there's that top, there's uh, P, and then that stands for God the Father, and then the F stands for Jesus Christ, and then the two S's re represents the, the Holy Spirit of God. So you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then these lines that all go to the center with that center circle that says God. So God the Father is God. Jesus the Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They're equally God. God the Father isn't more God than Jesus. Jesus isn't less God than the Holy Spirit. The three are equal. The three are equal in the fact that they are they are God. But I also love about this is that, yes, the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. There are three distinct personalities within this unity of the Trinity. This is good, good core theology, to have a proper understanding of God the Father, God the Son, and God the the Holy Spirit. Counterfeit Christ deny this, and they attack Christ. And he is not God, may question his humanity, they may question his divinity. Or they may say, yes, Jesus was a Savior, but you need something else in addition to that. You need to follow this rule, or, or do this, or do that. Uh, John says deny, they deny that Jesus is the Christ, deny the Father, to deny the Son. That word deny means belief, and it also has to do with behavior, how a person acts. So we spot Antichrist by their belief and by their behavior, how they act, what they do. And eventually they expose themselves. They expose themselves as false Christs, as liars. John says in verse 19, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. 
by your fruit you will know them. It's by what they do that really shows what their doctrine is. These false teachers can, it's disturbing. It can show up in the church. They can show up in the church. Ideas, philosophies can come in and try to corrupt the church. That's why John's so forceful. That's why John calls them antichrist. He's protecting these dear children, protecting this church that he loves so much. Now, I want to spend the last few minutes talking about us today. How, how are we to stay the, the course as Christ followers? How are we to protect ourselves from these false teachers and those who want, as John says, to lead us astray? Now, let me offer three things. The first one is, is to know the truth, to know the truth. We know the truth, John said. The truth is within us. We need to know the truth. That is, we need to know the Word of God. Uh, false teachers are always defeated by the Word of God. The Word of God will always triumph over lies. That means we need to know God's Word. We need to be in God's Word every day. It's really our lifeline. John Bunyan, he's the author of Pilgrim's Progress. And it was said that his blood, I had heard of different blood types. I know there's different blood types. They said he had a blood type that I had never heard of. They said his blood was Bibline, B-I-B-L-I-N-E. That is, if you cut him, the Bible would flow from his veins. <laughs> it was just ingrained in him, just a part of who he was. The enemy can't stand that. What a way to defeat those forces that try to attack us, that try to lead us astray. Immerse yourself in, in the Word of God each and every day. Uh, second thing is to abide in Christ. To abide in Christ, John says, we're to remain in Jesus. And I think sometimes we can do a good job at, at knowing the truth. And that's so important to know the truth. But if it's just something in our minds, if it's just information, if it's just data, then we've really missed the point. The Christian life it's about knowing the truth and knowing God and, and loving God and developing this intimacy with God to remain in him. Not just to know things about him, but to remain in him, to live in him, to abide in him, to receive life itself from our connection with the Savior. So yes, we read the word of God. But we also pray. We also meditate. We live in community because in community we see Christ and one another. We abide in Christ. We stay attached to him. We don't stray from him. We don't get led astray from him. But we follow our Savior. The word remain or abide, it means to, to get your roots down deep, to plant your roots deep, deep, deep into the soil deep into the soil of God's word, deep into the soil of God's love and God's heart. Now, the final thing <clears throat> is to remember our anointing. Remember your anointing. Verse 20, John said, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. And then in verse 27, as for you, the anointing you received remains in you. Verse 27 again, his anointing teaches you about all things. Verse 27, again, that anointing is real. It's not counterfeit. Anointing, 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 anointing. What, what's he talking about? We're in the midst of a, of a spiritual battle each and every day of our lives. We may not recognize it, may not see it. Uh, it's there. It's reality. We are in the midst of a great conflict between the forces of evil and God's good forces. People each and every day are falling <laughs> on the battlefield. It, it happens all the time. I, I got an email yesterday. I'll tell you a couple stories here at the end. I uh, got an email yesterday, and the email was very short. It was one sentence, actually, and I'm going to read it to you. This is the entire text of the email. Quote, he did not come home last night. Payday. Unquote. And there, there was a name in the subject line of the email, 
But I didn't need it. As soon as I read that sentence, I knew exactly who was being talked about. He did not come home last night, comma, payday. I knew right then who it was. There's someone in our church family right now that is being led astray. He's being led astray. I don't, I, this was Friday, I believe. Didn't come home Friday night. Uh, Mark, I talked to Mark this morning. Mark was in touch with his, his the one spoken of, spoke with his wife last night, and, and he still hasn't come home. I don't know the story. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't know specifics. But here's a brother that's being led astray. He's allowing himself to be led, led astray. This is real, real life. And John is trying to protect us, to stay deeply rooted in God's Word and to abide in Christ, to live in Christ, to live with one another in community, in healthy community where we love one another and hold one another accountable, support one another. And then to remember that God has anointed us. He has placed his spirit within us. And we don't have to fall to temptation. We don't have to be led astray. We can come home. Pray for this brother. Pray for him. Uh, the last thing I wanted to share is, it, what does it mean to be anointed by God? The, the word anointed in classical Greek, it mean, I love this, it means to smear or spread or rub over. And I, when I read that, I did love that. God has anointed us. Uh, the Holy One has anointed us. He has smeared himself on us. He has spread himself on us. It's a beautiful image. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, I, I thought it was just by chance, but I found a college course on CD on the American Revolution, the whole revolutionary period, and I'm almost done with it. I, I just I look forward to driving to church and listening to it. I'm trying to use that time more wisely, and, and it's a great course, and the professor's going back and going pre-revolution all the way through post-revolution and on and on. Um, and he talked quite a bit about George Washington. And, you know, I expected that, but I learned so much. One of the things I learned was that when we think of the American Revolutionary War, I think of the Americans, the Continental soldiers, I think of the colonies fighting the British. That George Washington had to fight the British Army. And he did. But there was another enemy, even more powerful than the British Army. And that was smallpox. There was a deadly smallpox epidemic going through the colonies during the Revolutionary War. Uh, more soldiers died of disease in the Revolutionary War than they did in battle. So Washington, uh, the war apparently as it began, he had several battles, and they, it just went horribly. It was just a debacle after debacle, and it looked horrible. And then Washington had to make a decision about this smallpox thing and this disease that threatened to kill his army, and it was killing his army. And historians believe now that the single greatest thing George Washington did in winning the Revolutionary War was having his soldiers, requiring his soldiers to be inoculated from the disease of smallpox. So that got me thinking. I mean, the Revolutionary War, I mean, we'd be singing British songs here this morning, I guess. Uh, we'd be singing. <laughs> song, we wouldn't have our independence. Uh, it not, it, our independence wasn't, worn, uh, wasn't won by a musket, really, or a sword, but by a scalpel. It was a scalpel that, that really strengthened these soldiers to be able to fight this war. I'm going to read you something. This is from one of the historians. So Washington understood the ravaging implications of a smallpox epidemic within the congested conditions of the encampment, and he regularly quarantined patients that were infected with the virus 
And although many educated Americans opposed inoculation, believing that it actually spread the disease, Washington strongly supported it. When historians debate Washington's most consequential decisions as commander-in-chief, they are almost always arguing about specific battles. A compelling case can be made that his swift response to the smallpox epidemic and to a policy of inoculation was the most important strategic decision of his military career. We have been anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. He doesn't stand outside of us. He lives within us. He's in our very hearts, our very souls. He runs through our veins. God has inoculated us in a sense. We might be led by him, strengthened by him, to stay firm in the midst of this crazy, crazy world, to not lose heart by all that happens around us, but to stay faithful to Christ, to remember that that spirit is at work within us, that anointing is real. It's not fake. It's not counterfeit. God is within us. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your tenacious love. We thank you for placing the Spirit within us. That when we place our trust in you, when we cry out to you and receive you as our Lord and Savior, you place the Holy One, the Holy Spirit, within our very hearts and lives. Lord, sometimes we forget that and we allow ourselves just to be carried away, to be led astray, to fall so easily into temptation and sin. But you've given us a power within to stay true to you, to stay faithful to you. Lord, I am just so concerned today about our brother that's still away from home. Lord, I pray he'll come to his senses right now and and, Lord, we pray you'll protect him uh, from great evil. And we entrust ourselves to you, Lord. Thank you for your patience and your love. Thank you for how gracious you are to us each and every day. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.